So this is my talk uh, on hot dogs uh, and image classification uh, and convolutional neural networks. By the end of this talk, um, I'm going to show you how you can take a powerful 140 million parameter state-of-the-art convolutional neural network, feed it a couple thousand pictures of things that are uh, pizza and things that are not pizza, uh, and train it to tell them apart with 97% accuracy. Um, uh, try to, there we go. Introductions are in order. Uh, my name is Brendan. Uh, it's good to be back here in New York. I used to be uh, on the data team at Etsy. Now uh, I work as a software developer at 18F, uh, which is very different than Etsy. Uh, it's a small organization inside the government that's basically helping to modernize a lot of digital services. Bringing it into the 20th century best practices is what I like to think. Uh, 21st century reach goal. Um, uh, but this talk has nothing to do with my work. Uh, it, it has to do with my interest in uh, hilarious television shows, uh, specifically uh, this HBO comedy called Silicon Valley. Um, so just by a show of hands, uh, who here is familiar with this scene uh, and this episode uh, that introduces this, this piece of technology. All right, a good number. Um, for those who haven't, it's okay. I'm gonna give a brief synopsis right now. So this character right here, uh, Jin Yang, along with his business partner, uh, Ehrlich Bachman, who you'll see in a second, secured some VC money to build a Shazam for food app. Stab a picture of a dish and have the food items automatically identified. This scene is him uh, demoing the prototype. Uh, and it works. Uh, man, this, it works kind of. Uh, it can successfully uh, identify pictures of hot dogs, uh, and, and people are impressed. Uh, <laughs> the downside is that everything else kind of just goes into this big bucket uh, of not hot dogs. <laughs> uh, so it's definitely an MVP. Jin Yang apparently read The Lean Startup. Uh, so he's shipping early. Um, <laughs> but it's still pretty impressive. I mean, uh, being able to do this and the math and technology concepts behind it uh, in this type of problem are still super interesting. And so that's what I, I want to go through today. Um, there's like a three second latency of when I want to change the slide and when I are, am able to do it. So I'm sorry for that. Um, but just quickly, I want to touch on the goals for this session. Um, there's going to be a lot of kind of generalizations and details skipped. For one thing, we don't have a lot of time. For another thing, I don't know very much stuff. Uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, and so it's not going to be exhaustive. Uh, but I do want to give a decent baseline on some concepts. Uh, and I want to instill in you just the confidence and knowledge and just familiarity with some terms that will allow you to kind of explore further on your own. Um, and I also want to show you that with very little Python code, you can get up and running uh, and, and using state-of-the-art deep learning models uh, with, with ease. Um, and so there's some code that we'll get to a little later on, um, but there's much more in a Jupyter notebook uh, that I linked to at the end. Um, and, so, and all of this is on GitHub, so definitely encourage you to browse it and use afterward. Um, all right. So... Uh, hot dogs, not hot dog problem. What is this? This is an image classification problem. Given an image, what is, uh, what is it? What's the label? Um, and, and this is something that's kind of second nature for, for us as people. Um, but for computers, it's tougher. Um, and there are a number of challenges uh, that it has to, uh, that it, that it has to, uh, control for. So things like the same thing being different sizes. We have 7-7 seven, seven Manupal and 5-3 Muggsy Bogues. Uh, those are both humans, very different humans. Uh, uh, sometimes the same person uh, can look like they're two different sizes just because of how the Im image is taken. You have things like occ occlusion where you don't see uh, the, full, the full thing, um, like these cute uh, puppy pugs. We all know they're them. We can just see their heads. Um, there's a lot of other stuff, too, like background noise, um, uh, uh, lighting issues, um, orientation uh, differences. Um, so su suffice it to say, there are obstacles. 
Um, so what, how can we solve this? Um, the answer is we're going to use machine learning here, uh, and this is a supervised learning problem. So this means we give an algorithm a bunch of examples that include the answers. We say, here are some images of hot dogs. Here are some images of cats. Here are some images of dogs. This is the training set. And after seeing a lot of these examples, the algorithm is able to gradually figure out what to look for in these images to tell them apart. It's able to learn a function with various parameters such that you can give it an image on one side and the other side you get a label of what that image is. So how, do these, how, do, how does it learn these parameters? Um, the general approach is, 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 is relatively simple. At first, it, doesn't, it just guesses uh, and it's flat out wrong. It says, I think this is a dog. And then we say, and then we tell it, actually, that thing is a toad. And after like a little embarrassment, it, there's a mathematical process where the network um, makes very small changes in those parameters so that the next time it sees a toad, it's, it's going to be a little more likely uh, to, to predict that. And this process just repeats tens of millions of times over all, all of the images. Um, so there's a lot of different types of machine learning methods that can do this type of thing. Um, the one that we're going to focus on is, is called convolutional neural networks, um, which is, uh, and these things, these things are great. They can recognize people, places, and things in photos. Um, this is the technology that powers uh, self-driving cars, um, identifies outliers in medical imagery. These are super powerful things. Um, and, but before we jump into them, let's first quickly touch on just ordinary uh, neural networks. Um, so, what's a neural network? Uh, it's pretty simple, actually. It's just a network of neurons. Uh, glad I could clear that up for you guys. <laughs> Have a good night. Uh, no, so let's start just with the basic uh, zoom in on one, one of these neurons. A neuron, often called a unit, it's just a little function. It, uh, it takes some inputs, it does a computation on it, and it passes uh, that output to some other units that it's connected to. Um, what are those inner operations that are happening uh, inside that little function? Um, basically, every one of these neurons has, some, has a set of weights. These are just numbers, uh, and these are the parameters that the network adjusts over time as it, as it learns. These weights get combined with the inputs um, via, some, uh, via matrix multiplication, so some linear algebra here, uh, which it turns out is actually not as hard as it, I thought it was back in college. Uh, so give it another shot. Um, then you take the result of that, uh, add another variable. This is called the bias. This is also a parameter that gets adjusted um, or learned over time as, uh, during the training process. And finally, you take the result of that, you pass it through what's called an activation function. And typically, this is just a, a nonlinear transformation. Um, that uh, facilitates neural networks to learn uh, nonlinear relationships uh, in the data sets. Uh, and that's, that's essentially it. Um, outputs of, uh, the outputs of one neuron are inputs to, to ones that, uh, that are connected to it. Uh, and generally, these units are organized into layers, um, and each of these layers connects to the next. The most basic layer structure is, is what's called a dense layer, and this is where each unit in one layer is connected to all of the units in the, in the, in the following layer. Um, these are also called fully connected layers. Um, the layers in between the input and the output layers are called hidden layers. You've heard the term deep learning. That just means there's multiple hidden layers in the network. Um, and the last layer, the output layer, this, this is where in classification settings, this is where all of the information before it gets distilled down into probabilities. So 32% cat, 14% banana. That happens at that last layer. Um, After you pass an input through all of these layers, uh, which we call forward pass, at the end you get a prediction. Um, and this is where we compute how good or bad that prediction is uh, uh, from the answer, which it knows. This is called the loss function. Um, and the goal here is to minimize that loss. So the smaller the loss, 
the closer the guesses are to the actual answers. Um, and so from here, this, can, this is basically just an optimization problem. How can we tweak all of these parameters in the network so that our, our prediction gets a little bit better the next time? And these layers uh, depend on each other. Um, and so to fix the output, you have to go back and fix the, uh, the neurons in the layer before. And then you have to go back and fix the ones before that. And so this process of going back to understand the impact and how you have to tweak each of these parameters and each of these neurons is, is a process called uh, backpropagation. Um, all right, so very general overview of neural networks. Now, uh, now we're ready to talk about convolutional neural networks. Um, these are also called convnets, which I always struggle to say, so I won't say it anymore. Uh, also called CNNs. Um, Resisting a fake news joke. Uh, uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, these are very similar to neural networks. Um, they're still made up of neurons that have learnable weights. They're still composed of layers that transform some input to an output with a differentiable equation. Uh, they're different than ordinary neural networks in that they're more tailored to deal with image inputs. Uh, and they also have some special types of layers that allow them to handle this type of information a little more efficiently. Um, it's important to keep in mind what these inputs look like. Um, and so to us, it's an image. To a computer, it's, it's just a grid of, of numbers here. And so an image is just a, a matrix of pixel values. Uh, each of these pixels has information encoded in them, such as uh, red uh, RGB color values from, you know, from 0 to 255. So that's... Uh, that's the initial inputs going into this convolutional neural net. Um, what are the main types of layers that um, CNN share? Uh, so we have convolutional layers, we have pooling layers, uh, and then we have fully connected layers. So let's go through each of those. Convolutional layers. This is the model namesake, the core building block uh, to the to the network, and this is the one that does most of the computational heavy lifting. Um, so in general, here's what's happening here. We have a filter, and this is actually a set of learnable weights, which we talked about earlier. These are just parameters that get tweaked. Um, and you can think of this filter as just a small grid. Uh, and this filter slides over the entire image. More precisely, this is called convolving over the entire image. Um, there are set, you can control how it slides over. Does it go pixel by pixel? Does it jump by five? How big the box is? These are all things that can be uh, set. Um, as it slides across the image, it's doing a computation with the region that it's directly over. And it's storing the result of that. Um, and that result is called the activation map or the feature map or the convolved feature. I don't know why the same thing has so many different thing, ways of saying it, but that's, I'll, I'll, I'll call it the activation map. Um, and so that explanation's a bit abstract, uh, but you can basically think of these filters as, as feature identifiers. So things like uh, horizontal lines or vertical lines or, or, or slight curves uh, or, you know, simple colors. Um, and so as an example, if you have a filter that looks like a horizontal line, as this goes across the image, it gets excited when it encounters something in the input that, is, that has a similar pattern. And that excitement corresponds with higher values in the feature map. Um, so here's just kind of the math uh, breakdown of the, the filter uh, convolving with a section of the input and doing matrix multiplication and storing the results in the activation map uh, on the right side there. So, um, this convolutional process repeats. Uh, and as it goes along the path, this, this pathway, these filters become more abstract, more interesting over time. At first, Filters are, are very simple things, like here in layer one. We just have simple lines or a color gradation. As you move on to other uh, convolutional layers, 
the filters um, and the features that it's identifying are, are more abstract and bigger. So instead of a line, you now have, you can see on the bottom right, uh, a corner, so two lines together, or a circle pattern. Um, and it's important to keep in mind here, these filters are not programmed into the, to the network. These are, these are learned. Um, so th basically, as it processes these millions of images tens of times, it's figuring out the, 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 the types of things in the images such that it can, uh, it can pick apart them later and say, oh, those are hot dogs, if it has that, or, or it's not a hot dog, um, based on these other things. After the convolution, uh, we have a pooling layer. These are much, much simpler than conv convolution layers. Um, the role here is just to reduce the spatial si size, the dimensionality of the feature map, while still uh, retaining the most important features. Um, there are different ways to do this. This one's called max pooling, and this is basically just defining a neighborhood, like a, a two by two window, uh, and taking the, the largest value uh, and, and, and carrying that over, um, and doing that for all regions in the feature map. So we get this kind of simplified feature map. Um, and then what often happens is you have a series of these alternating convolution layer, then pooling layer, and then another convolution layer followed by another pooling layer. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind here that the first convolution and pooling, that is um, operating on the input image, so the raw pixels. But in the next convolutional layer, it's not operating on the raw pixels, it's actually operating on the output from the preceding pooling. So that kind of simplified feature map. Finally, at the end of, of, of these convolution and pooling uh, layers, we have a final fully connected layer. This is the layer that takes all the information before it and uses it to classify the, the, the input image into the various classes that it knows about. Um, you can think of this whole training process as like showing a child many images of things and having him, gradu having him or her gradually figure out what to look for in those images to tell them apart. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, a really cool uh, Python library called Keras. Um, this is a high level neural network library. It sits on top of uh, lo lower level libraries like Theanu and uh, TensorFlow. Um, and it basically provides an API that's very similar to what you may know from uh, Scikit-learn, which, which is another popular machine learning Python library. Um, and Scikit-learn makes classifiers super easy, like one line to instantiate a classifier, one line to train it, one line to measure the performance. It's, with Keras, it's only a little more complicated than that. Uh, and so it's, it's just, it's really uh, easy to use uh, and, and user friendly. Okay, uh, five minutes. Uh, and so you can make, uh, you can make CNNs from scratch with Keras. You can also use pre-trained models um, and use those as well. Um, what's a pre-trained model? So, if you're, uh, instead of rolling your own architecture and figuring out all those settings, how many layers do I need, you don't need to really worry about that. Um, you can just use a state-of-the-art model that's out there and use it as is or use it as the basis for, um, use it as an input and tweak it a little bit for your own data set. There's a really large image data set called ImageNet out there. It contains like it contains over a million labeled images with thousands of categories. And there's a yearly competition to classify these images. The models that win are huge, uh, uh, hundreds of millions of, imp of parameters. They take weeks to train. They're super accurate and they're publicly available uh, for you to use. And and Kiris makes it really easy to do that. So we're going to use this one called. Uh, uh, VJJ16. This was the runner-up 2014. Uh, it has 13 convolutional layers, uh, over 100 million weights. Um, and so let's, so here, you can kind of see it in action. So we just, we load it in. Um, we do a little pre-processing on the image. So this is basically just taking that image from our file system, turning it into an input vector with the correct dimensions that VGG expects. Um, once we do that, we can just feed it right into the model and see the predictions. And so remember, this model was trained to identify a thousand different categories, and so the output here actually has a thousand different things that correspond with the probabilities of it being uh, each of those each of those labels. So we can kind of sort that list and show the top five uh, probability uh, top five predictions uh, for this model. So 
you can use this as is, um, and it actually would work for this. Uh, so some of the labels in this data set are things like hot dogs uh, and pizza. So like, you could actually just use it as is and make a rule that's like, if the probability of it being a pizza is over some threshold, let's say it's a pizza. If not, we'll say it's not a pizza. You could do that, and it'd work pretty well. It's not, that's not super generalizable, though. Um, and it imposes these rules that we're just kind of uh, making up. So the better thing to do would be to use transfer learning. Um, this process involves taking an existing uh, neural net and using it as a basis for a new model. The intuition here is that a new data set may be too small to train well by itself, but we know that most neural nets trained to learn image features often learn similar features anyways, especially at the, the early stages where the things that it's picking up are more generic, so things like edges and blobs. And so we can take a big pre-trained model, take off that last fully connected layer, the thing that computes the thousand probabilities, and add a new layer uh, that instead uh, produces the probabilities of the classes that we care about in our data set. So pizza or not pizza or hot dog and not hot dog. And, and again, it's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very minimal code uh, to do that. Um, and so what's happening here is we've frozen the weights of the, the main convolutional layers. How many, two minutes? Okay. We've frozen the weights of the convolutional layers beforehand, and we just have this one new classification layer at the end. And so this is the thing that it's learning. Um, and, and this is what it looks like. Um, so we're not going to be able to get to this Jupyter notebook. Um, oh, no. But I encourage you to go there afterward. Um, it has more code samples. Um, another way to deal with small image data sets, besides doing transfer learning, is, is this process called data augmentation. This is where you basically add images that are just random transformations of existing images you have. So you add a little, you know, you move it over, you have this input pizza, you move it over a little bit to the left or right, you do some uh, zooming or uh, shifting, and then you have a lot more images to use for training. Um, it walks through using just a pre-trained uh, uh, net just as it is, as we kind of looked at before. Um, it shows you, if you didn't want to do transfer learning and you want, or you wanted to get a baseline, how does uh, my transfer learning model compare to just a convolutional neural net I, I built up from scratch? That's what's happening in this section here. So we just do, we have a data set here that has a thousand images of pizza or not pizza. Uh, it does some uh, cleanup. Uh, and then builds that, that simple model. Um, and so I, I definitely encourage you guys to go through that. Um, there's a ton of awesome resources on the web uh, for, this, for this stuff. Um, these are some of my favorites. Um, and then, you know, I think lastly, uh, if there's any takeaways from the session, I hope you just have some optimism and some excitement that, that you can uh, jump in here um, and you could jump into this really fascinating, powerful field and do some cool stuff. Um, and so I encourage you to just um, get your, your hands dirty with something silly, something with hot dogs uh, or bagels or some other awesome New York food, um, and learn about all the other stuff you need to know uh, along the way. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, enjoy the rest. I got them.